So, well, if you keep it very upset because I this was actually a Polish, not a Polish international unit, <laughs> they wanted to add more to that. But you see, the, the angst you must find is you don't want to go the world with it. Thanks Can you share a bit with us as to what sort of things you were trying to do and how you so quickly cemented it down and put Kwazulu Natal on the map in the way it is? Kwazulu Natal was the easiest negotiation of all. Actually, I wasn't involved. <laughs> It was done by the locals for Kwazulu Natal. And it was very easy because the choice was so soft. Either the IFP, the ANC, DA, and the NFP were together, or it would be Zuma and the EFF. And they fell on one step short of getting that critical majority, which was the NFPC. I tell you, margins in South Africa are greater than that's why every vote counts. And the critical question, the only question, the question, the only question that whole negotiation was with the NFP. It's only a question. And they came with us. And then we went, pew, 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 and fixed up. But the, the important thing was the ANC has this huge pr principle of the biggest part of the state of the Premier, except in Bosnia, where the IFP is the biggest part of the coalition, but ANC is the We said, look, I'm the important. If we establish a principle, it's a principle for everybody, and we do it for you. And then the IFP go. So that is fine at that point. So we have failed the negotiation party. Mm. And that was one of the was. But it was one with Panyasa the Sufi, does anybody know the name? Panyasa the Sufi. Panyasa the Sufi is the leader of the RET, that's the Radical Economic Transformation Faction in Kanti. And the Niyasa the Sufi is a very difficult and complex individual who has so much time that he couldn't dare to help us in any meaningful role in the government because he knew that he would undergo a lot of things. And so he was not prepared to, in any way, share power with us in a meaningful way. Now, you've got to understand, in counting the ANC fell to 34%. And we got 28%. So we were literally six percentage points behind the ANC. And we said, right, there's a proportionality clause in the agreement. So now we have broad proportionality. And in the government, there are 13 positions. So we said that in seven for you and six for us. And if you want to bring anybody else in, you pick up one of your positions. If we want to bring in somebody else, we give up one of your positions. Oh no, they want to make room for all the smaller parties because they want to have cover to, so they don't have to send in a coalition here. And um, they want to bring in all the other smaller parties. They said, we will give you three positions and the other smaller parties three positions. That will be your six. I said, oh, my dear God. You know, uh, you're, so no, they were definitely not going to do that. And I said, well, there's no room. There's no room. They're not going anywhere. And then I pushed them quite hard and they later admitted that they weren't intending to give any other smaller party any seats at all. They were just pushing us to go agree that we'd take three and give three to the smaller parties, and the smaller parties wouldn't get any. And we'd be sitting with three and they'd have ten. <laughs> That's what they did. And I said, look, you don't come here and try and manipulate us like this. It's just dishonest. So these are negotiations are now over. Goodbye. And I went out and I had a big press conference. So so anyway, I mean, I said, I said to the public jet in Johannesburg, I said, you know, we got 28% of the vote, thank you very much, but if you want us to be in government, we have to be these parties. So I'm very close, six percentage points, and you know what to do in Johannesburg, Swani, Kuruleni, and Mahali City next time. So I'd much rather be in opposition to Panyasa Sufi than be captured. 
And it was a very right thing to do because he wouldn't tell us which portfolios he was going to give us. And the two big ones of provincial government are education and health. And in the end, he gave the other three parts, the, the seats that he was going to give to us. One is agriculture in Khate. Rooftop garden. Yeah. And the other one is, he, he invented something called e-government, which no one's ever heard of. I mean, it is a thing, but you don't ever have a, you only make a department like that, and you don't want to make mm-hmm. anything else. And then the third one was environment, which he said we need to clean up the streets of Johannesburg. Which has got nothing to do with commercial governments. So they were just trying to manipulate us, and uh, and at one stage, it was very disarmingly honest. He said to a journalist, "We can't possibly let the DA have a serious department because if we do, they'll just do it better than us and get more votes." So we were very honest about that. And but that's exactly it was two things. They didn't want us to get a decent portfolio to show what we do. And they were terrified of skeletons that you would dig up. So, we didn't do it. In my leadership term, I added over 2 million votes to the DA's total between 2007 when I became the leader and 2015. So, that was great, but I thought, okay, now I've taken the body as far as I can go. And if we need a black leader that has the same liberal values and vision, we'll grow nicely. And Rusi Maimani had pitched up on the scene and I thought he had what it took. You know, he ticked all the boxes. Non-racialism, understanding market economics, ethical, I thought, okay, great. All the boxes were ticked. And he turned out not to be any of the above, I'm afraid. And between 2015 and 2019, we lost over six hundred thousand dollars from all communities. So we went backwards for the very first time since nineteen ninety four. And then he set up a commission to investigate. And the commission came up and said it's only commission that's going to want to disintegrate. So he had to step down. And by that stage a hell of a lot of people were approaching me and saying, Will I please come back? So I was happily retired and getting on with my own life. But Ruth had done his very best to push around the party after I'd done absolutely everything to support him. Do that as a way. If you want to any loyalty in politics, they say get a dog. <laughs> so that's fine. But I don't know that. But he was unraveling the party and it was really dramatically going backwards and the machinery of the party was going backwards. She didn't convince that I really have to stand. So I thought, discuss with my husband, he said to me, are you mad? You know, you're going to do X and Y. <laughs> and then he woke up the next morning and says, no, I know you, you'll never rest if you don't give it a try, so go do it. So I stood, I ran a campaign, and I got through on the first ballot. I got through on the first ballot, and then the next time I was unopposed, you know, no, no, the next time I wasn't unopposed, I was opposed, but then I got well, I was two thirds, and the next time I was unapproached. So, mm-hmm. that's where we are today. Well, tomorrow we have the medium term budget policy mm-hmm. set, and that's a big milestone, and that is where the government announces its policy objectives in the medium term budget set. Mm-hmm. And we've got an excellent Deputy Minister of Finance, he's very attuned to Gorowana. And we've worked very hard to get some things into that medium to the budget policy set. Now, before I was going to appear today, Paul National Solution, just as I said, our deputy minister comes and don't say anything about market sensitivity and this or that. So I said I won't. But I said, they agreed that I could say that there's going to be a lot of focus on infrastructure and a lot of focus on ensuring it's a debt. Don't go into further debt. To fund grants and lavish lifestyles and all that nonsense. And that um, we protect franchise services as hard as we can. So that's what we're going to be doing. And it's the first time we've we been landing some of our policies and about putting in the budget. If it's only a budget, it's no way. So, you know, that's where it's going to be. And so Ashwell has done a bloody heroic job, but he's had the treasury behind. 
cannot tell you how relief the treasury is at the real level. And they've been fighting a lot of abuse in government spending, and now we can really give them biggest back. So it's interesting to find out how many allies we actually have got in government. And it's really useful to use that muscle. But believe me, it's incredibly important to get attacking this. This was very important. So I don't know what. Gwili says, you know, Gwili, the Sunday Times ran a big headline. Gwili, Silla, you are not the boss, remember that? <laughs> and I read that article, it was an absolute nothing article. And I found the Sunday and I said, you guys just didn't have a front page lead and were searching around for something to write. And this is exactly what happened. And then while I was, while I was sorry, I found it in not remember. Why was we here fighting with people because he always does? So, in the letter he wrote to you. Oh, the letter! You it's like the uh, insulting remark. Of course he did. No, but that, that's a very important story. That's a very, very, very insulting story. And then we'll take another question. Oh, no. <laughs> Sorry, I'm carrying No, please go ahead. I'm curious now. <laughs> so, we've just agreed on a proportionality calculus. And we're now negotiating cabinet positions. And so, well, of course, I will not say how many positions we're going to be in total war. And obviously, if you don't know how many positions are going to be there in total war, you don't know what a third of the positions are. Because the ANC got 40%, you got 20%, they have to have two to one, we get a third, they get two thirds, right? Well, you can only work out a third or two thirds if you want the total. It's gone, we all know that much of this. And he wasn't going to tell us that. Right? So we he promised the next group was going to have smaller cabinets, so we thought, okay, well, this will be too optimistic. Let's work on about 27, and we then entitled to nine. And you don't get in with your bottom line, you go in with, you know, a negotiating position. So we, so I wrote to Melissa and I said, we would like a cabinet minister in each of the clusters, and we would like <laughs> this. And I listed 10 people. They come to you, the letter to the press, and say, you look at this cheeky deal. How dare they say this? How dare they? I said, how do you mean how dare they? We've just signed an agreement. It has a proportionality clause. It has a power sharing. What are you talking about? Do you think that we are sitting here and taking what you are kindly going to offer us? You did not win an election. Nor did we. We write to you as partners in the coalition to say, what is our due arising from the agreement? That was the first time it really did this. This guy's done They do you as famous. I don't see this as a power sharing arrangement. And so we had hit back very hard on that. I did. So that was um, Cyril. Well, if you keep it, got very upset because I said this was actually a coalition, not a government national union. <laughs> they wanted to add much that. But you see, the, the ANC must don't want to go the way of looking. Well, you see, the interesting thing was that in the negotiations, there was one portfolio that the ANC obsessively had to control, and that was international relations. They were absolutely obsessive. To the point that we got together and we said, okay, well, you know, we can sort this all out by saying we insist on having international relations. And we're going to make Tony Lee on the... <laughs> if we do that, they'll say, you can have anything except that. <laughs> then a whole lot of stuff by using that leverage, you know. <laughs> but I couldn't work out why they were so, so obsessively in international relations. And this is my conclusion. I've got no evidence for this whatsoever. But I think the ANC gets funded by these rogue regimes. I think they get funded by Iran. I think they get funded by Russia. I think and they cannot let go that that link. I don't think that the International Court of Justice was an initiative by the South African government. I think it was a broke from Array. And um, mm. you know, the, I think they are, have such a connection with these road regimes for funding and everything else that that's what they do. 
So to ask the first question, the convening power in Britain was all Lud Ray and his colleagues. So that was, he must take all the political powers. Lud Ray is the uh, international chair of the DA board. We take that absolutely very, very seriously because it brings a lot of votes. And we ran a big court case in South Africa to enable consulates and honorary consulates to be voting stations as well because the IEC completely uh, limited that to embassies where there are South African stations. And we said, no worries, the law doesn't say that. So we fought a case and won it, but it was too late to make the logistic arrangements. So in a sense, it was a very victory. We probably would have had two whole seats of Parliament with that rough on the board. And we're very keen on getting something in Perth, for example, which just has an honorary consulate. And there are literally tens of thousands of mm-hmm. scientists. So we are very serious about the DA board. And we're serious because there are South Africans who live in the board who actually want to come back to the country. They don't want to lose their contact with the country. And we are desperate to make it possible for them to come back to the country. So we keep the contact, and Ludre is the international big, big chief of DA board, and so he did the convening. He pumps everybody up and gets them all into the chairs to use the South African oil. I think the stickers on there and say, What better idea? I don't think he gets anybody had a chance in his very democratic way. Anyway, he did it very, very well. So that's the answer to the first question. The second question is just put in my name because I've seen it's hard. You're plumped. Oh, okay. The DA. That's where we ask that one. Plus, that one is Let me just answer that question. In Johannesburg, you can go weeks without the mm-hmm. And when you've got all your basic services, you can start being spun mm-hmm. with kinds of lines about how the world issue in South Africa is race and this and that. When you don't have water, you think, Maybe we should make the issue water. Maybe we should make the issue electricity. Maybe we should make the issue filling the hospitals. Maybe we should make the issue getting the traffic lights with. <laughs> and suddenly the issues become the issue. <laughs> and you see that everything else has been a deliberate ruse to take your eyes off the issues. And so where the DA governs things, things work. And I'm afraid the Congress is also true. And people see that. And the more they see basic services working, the more they like it. It takes a long time, but eventually the issues do become the issues. The critical thing is, do you want decent education? Do you want water? Do you want electricity? Do you want roads that function? Do you want us to get the 21 kilometers of rail, 21,000 kilometers of rail that is now unserviceable back into service? Do you want people to have a commuting system that works? Think a bit about it. And the DA is the only non racial party, actually. It's the only credible non racial party. The NC is 100% black now. And um, and it's got no minority, so they don't bother about you know, I mean, they don't even think about it. And so we're the one party that really has support from all races, and that's great, because it's all races who want a non-racial, inclusive future. <coughs> At least I am really friendly, and the ANC, <laughs> the ANC had to demonize me. The ANC had to demonize me because we were growing and winning the elections. That's why. So thank you very much, Helen. It's been an amazing, amazing time. I think we've heard some some good class language. We've heard some good quality stories. We've heard some realities, and we've heard some stuff that goes on behind the curtains. And I think it's given all of us, um, from the contribution to the floor, but primarily from you, on the journey you've been through over the last 18 months for the country, and it's going to take you, the party, and everyone else in the country to actually work out what is right for the country, for the people, to get us to those three things you're talking about, with growth, jobs, and investment. Mm. 
and also 100% critical. You've got the support for all your initiatives from overseas, whether we're DA or not, is besides the point. Uh, it is what's right for the country. <laughs>